Amen. We have been on a series uh, about the life of Paul. Pastor Brett has been teaching an amazing series, and today he's at our Santa Clara campus preaching, so I get the privilege of teaching today. And we're going to continue this thought on the life of Paul. But if you weren't here last week, we have CDs out in the lobby that you can grab for free. It's our gift to you. Uh, want to make sure you get this in case you weren't able to listen or be here last week. You can also download the message and listen to it on our webpage or get the app and listen it. Uh, to it that way. But if you weren't here last week or you missed some of the uh, previous weeks, please stop by out here and get the CD. Today we're going to continue talking about Paul. I'm excited to preach about Paul. I believe this guy has the greatest name in the Bible. It's a godly name. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited because Paul, who was Saul, when you look at his life, you realize this guy had a lot of problems. This guy wasn't a perfect person, uh, you know, that God chose because he was so perfect and so put together. We've been learning how messed up Saul was. Saul was out murdering Christians. Saul was out persecuting the church. Saul was literally fighting against God. And in Paul's life, it, it, when you look at how he was and who he was and the fact that God used him, man, that just gives me hope. That encourages me. And so... I want to read to you uh, the encounter that Paul has. Paul is, you know, living a life that's not pleasing to God, and God knocks Paul off his horse. Paul literally has an encounter with God. How many of you know an encounter with God will never leave you the same? Once you have an encounter with God, you can never go back. You'll never be the same. And it says in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, meanwhile... Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, and he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell down to the ground, and he heard the voice of the Lord saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? What an amazing moment Saul is having with God. What an amazing moment he's having here. When you have an encounter with God, everything changes. Jesus in one moment changes Saul forever. And if God can change Saul, then what could he do for me? What could he do for you? What could he do with me? And today, what I want to look at is a, a few key components that were really important to Paul's life, changing from Saul to Paul. A couple of things that we've talked about already, key, uh, a key aspect was this, Paul's relationships, who he hung out with. We used to say this all the time to the young people when we would travel into the high schools and do school assemblies, show me your three closest friends and I'll show you your future. Who you hang out with is very important. And when Paul has an encounter with God, immediately you see he's now hanging out with the men of God. His relationships were very important. We also see how last week we talked about how Paul handles waiting, that in times of waiting we're not to be just doing nothing and inactive, but we're to be serving and waiting on the Lord. And today what I want to look at is I want to look at how Paul handles change. Everything's about to change. And so today we're going to take a look at how Paul handles the change in his life. Would you play that video, please? I think change is one of those subjects that we like talking about, preaching about, reading books on, knowing we need to change, but how many, to be honest, we really don't like going through change? It's fun to talk about it, but it's a whole other thing to walk through it. It's true that in our lives, so many times we can hold on to things too tight. 
God wants to change certain things. God wants to keep changing us and making us better. We hold on. And the problem comes when God wants to change something in our lives and we want it to stay the same. Then what happens is we're no longer fighting change. We're actually fighting God. And guess what? God doesn't lose fights. Learning how to handle change is very important. Today we're going to look at how Paul embraced and walked through change. I want to remind us of Paul's calling, what he was originally called to do. It says in Acts 9 verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Paul was called to go to the Gentiles and to their people. He was their chosen instrument. He was to carry God's message to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. This is what God was called to do. Now, there was a season from Paul's calling up until this point today where he was serving in the church and he was part of what was happening in Antioch, and it was great. This was an amazing moment. This was good times. The church was growing. People were getting saved. These were days that were marked by God's favor. This Right now was the place to be in the early church where Paul was at. Paul was part of a dream team. And it's in this setting where everything's going good. It's in this setting where the ministry is strong and the church is strong. It's right here in the middle of all this success that God is going to change everything in Paul's life. Change is going to occur. If we're to move from where we are and what we are to what God has for us, it will not and cannot be done without change. For me, one of the best character, uh, characterize, one of the best words that characterizes obedience is change. If we're to be obedient to God and what he has for us, things are going to change. We can't obey God and stay the same. Just reading the word change for some of us causes us to shudder. I know very few people who enjoy change. It threatens our comfort. It interrupts our routines. It challenges our priorities. So for some of us, it introduces an anxiety in us, and I believe that at the end of the day, people want the product of change, but really don't want to go through the process of change. I would love to just be fit and in shape all the time. I, I just wish I could do it without actually having to go to the gym and run and lift something, you know. We want the product of change, but the process we have a problem with. And I'm convinced that living a life of obedience is impossible if you and I are unwilling to change. It's much easier to write it, to talk about it, but it's very difficult to put it into practice. But either way, I'm convinced change is part of it. Change will get introduced into our life a lot of times. We discover that when it comes, we aren't as prepared as we, as we thought. Have you ever had something come your way and you realize, man, I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't ready for the change that God had. But at the end of the day, change is inevitable. In our study here in the life of Paul, we watch closely as he handles the process of change. Change marked him in ways that prepared him uniquely for what God was planning for him. Little did he know it, but Saul was going to be in for more changes over and over in his life. Now, the Webster's Dictionary, I like this definition of the word change. In the Webster's Dictionary, it means this, to transform, to undergo an altercation, to become different. Maybe that explains why it's so hard and so challenging, because it's literally God saying, I want to make you into something different. I want you to become something that you're not. Though change is good, it's rarely pleasant. We're most interested in pursuing the comfortable route, but change is not comfortable. We prefer the road most frequently traveled, and for that reason, we often travel roads that look like they demand no change. What is the past of least resistance? And everything within us scrambles to stay on these trails that are easy, and God says, I've got a new path that I want you to go on, and everything begins to change. Frequently, we think change has to do with our location. Have you ever thought, if I could just get to a new job, if I could just get to a new place, if I could just move to a new town? And we try to change location without really changing ourselves, and that's not change, that's avoidance. We say, I don't like somebody. We don't like who they are, so I'm not going to talk to you. That's avoiding somebody. That's not working through the change that's required. Avoidance is not the same as change. Running away is not the same as becoming different. We shouldn't run away from people. We shouldn't run away from places. We should ask God to change. Real change always starts with us. 
inside here. It's not about location or comfort. It's about what God's doing inside of you, inside of me. Change is not about where you are or even what you do. Change is always about this, who you are and what you're becoming in Christ. In Acts 13, 9, we see a significant change that takes place in the life of Saul. It just says this in verse 9, then Saul, who was also called Paul, Amazing, just in one moment, his name changes. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked straight at Elimaeus and said, in one sentence, in one moment, Saul is Paul. Saul's name would change to Paul without any fanfare, without any attention or celebration in the middle of this story. In the middle of a sentence, we just see, boom, Saul becomes Paul. His name changed for one simple reason. Saul is a good Jewish name. But Paul is a name that the Gentiles would be accepting of. Everything began to change because of what Paul's calling was. Now, the name Paul is a fully Romanized name, and it means this. It means small. It's hard to brag right now on my name <laughs> when you know. <laughs> Some people have really cool names, and it means like mighty warrior and awesome man of God. You rock. Mine means small. But it had no Jewish roots to it. See, Paul was all about reaching the Gentiles. Did God change Saul's name? If he did, the Bible doesn't say he did. If it wasn't done by God, then Paul must have done it. Paul also referred to himself constantly as the least or the smallest of the apostles. Maybe this was a pun on the meaning of Paul, meaning small. That he wanted to be small so God could be big. Not just changing his name, but changing his attitude, changing who he was. Oh, God, change me so that my life would be small, so when people look at me, they don't see me, they see you living big in me. The name change was a personal change that prepared him for the mission that God was calling him to. A lot of the changes that take place in our life are preparing us for the things that God has for us. God has plans for Paul, but God never uses us without also helping us to change ourselves. So if you think God's only interested in you is to change where you are and what you do, then we don't understand how God changes us. God's first desire when it comes to change is to change us, the change he makes in us and to us and through us. Change will start with you, then it moves you towards what he has for you. It starts on the inside before it ever impacts the outside. That's why when, when we get saved and we give our life to the Lord, everything inside changes. Then the mission, the plan, the purposes begin to change. But it starts first with us. God wants to change us. Now, the tendency and the practice of many is to change due to personal comfort or discomfort and then blame God for it. We, we get good at that. We make changes that aren't really God, and then when they doesn't work out, we blame him. We hop from church to church, never really planting, never really serving, and then we blame God. We get divorced, and then we blame God for the changes, saying, well, this was his will. He told me to do it. You quit and pout, and then you blame God for why things aren't working out in your life. We run away from difficulty and broken relationships, and then we blame God's direction. Well, that was just what God was doing. I want to remind us today that we should not blame God for changes he hasn't called us to do. Don't use the Lord's name in vain. It says in Exodus 27, you shall not misuse the name's Lord. Don't make changes that are not God and then use God to blame him for things he never called us to do. Change is part of life. Change is something that God creates and directs, but it's always consistent in moving you toward the will that he has. Change is never based on your comfort. It is based on his plan for our lives. I'm convinced in life, the longer I live and the longer I serve God, he really doesn't care about my comfort. Has anyone noticed that or is that just me? <laughs> it seems like the more I live and the more I serve God, I start going, but God, I'm really comfortable. And he goes, yeah, that's okay. I, I don't really care about your comfort as much as you think I do. I care about you being great. I care about you doing the things that I've called you to do. I care about you becoming the man I want you to be. And you know, sometimes the only way to go through change is to go through the fire, to get to a place where you're uncomfortable because God is 
mending and working and molding you. I, I went to a chiropractor one time, and the first thing the guy did is he, I don't even know, he did some sort of ninja move on my head and my neck, and he went, kai, 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 and my whole body snapped and went into a position I didn't know, and I went, oh. And I realized that in order to get things lined up in my life the way they needed to be, he was going to have to change and pressure and put things in my body in a position I didn't want to be in. It wasn't comfortable, but you know what that chiropractor was doing? He was straightening my life out so that now I could walk and run and do things the way I was supposed to. Sometimes God puts pressure on our lives for us to change, and it's not comfortable, but it's what we need so that we can line up and run and do what God's called us to do. In Mark chapter 1, we see Jesus is ministering, and it says that he was healing the sick and preaching the gospel, and many were healed, and many were sick, and the whole town was really experiencing a move of God. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, the next day, he gets up, and the disciples are ready to keep doing more things there in the town. They're, they're excited, and they said, come on, the people are looking for you, and Jesus says this, let's go somewhere else. That is why I have come. Even when everything was going good, even when everything was really uh, uh, moving the way it should, Jesus said, it's time to go somewhere else. It's time to change. I think sometimes change is almost harder when everything's going good and things are successful and things are working out in your life. But our goal is not to just do things. Our goal is to follow God and whatever he has. And so when he says it's time to change, we change. We must be willing to follow Jesus even when he changes the direction in our life. So let's look back at the book of Acts, where Saul and Barnabas are now at. They're having the time of their lives. They're ministering together. They're in one of the most remarkable revivals in the early church. The church is growing. Lives are being transformed. An entire culture has come under the influence of the Spirit of God. This scene is incredible. It's exciting. And then suddenly God stepped in and everything changed. There's that word again. Everything changed. Chances are good that some of the believers in Antioch might have resisted. They might have even tried to stop the process of change, at least initially, but we don't see any hesitation with Saul. Saul doesn't say anything like, but Lord, things are going so good here. We don't see Saul go, hey, but God, what, what about the ministry that's taken place here? Not Saul. He doesn't struggle with it for one moment. He and change have gotten very well acquainted during the previous years of his life. And when God said it's time for change, Paul was ready. Let's look at this in Acts chapter 13, verse 2. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Look at these words, set apart for the work that I have called him. I love this because it's the, where we see the word work comes before calling. Work, then calling. It's a principle in these examples that if you are praying for God's leading and not getting the answer, first we need to examine, am I doing the work that God's called me to? If you're only waiting for God to answer in a state of inactivity, you will wait a long time. Pastor talked about this last week, that when we wait on God, we work for God. We serve God. Work for God. Then the calling. Then the ministry. Then the direction. And I believe this is true. And in my life, Shekinah and I, we have seen this a lot, that God likes to promote servants. People who are actively serving. People who are working. People who are already doing something, God says, I can use that. How many know it's hard to steer a parked car? I mean, you might be going the wrong way, but at least if you're moving, we can get you turned around. If you're doing nothing, you can't do anything with that. And God says, I'm looking for people who are serving and working. And so God is looking for Paul here. Matthew was running a business. The disciples were fishing. Peter, James, John, all the people who God uses, they were working. It's always sad to me to see people who sit in a state of inactivity waiting for God to call them. It doesn't work that way. Activity and obedience are key to our lives. Both of those are marked with the concept of change. If we're going to obey change, we've got to be active. We've got to be obedient. And let me tell you what, change requires fearless devotion to God. If you're really going to follow God into the unknown, if you're really going to step out of the boat, if you're really going to allow God to change things, it's going to take fearless devotion to God's will. If we are to change, we need to learn to welcome the risk. 
Have you ever heard the saying, no risk, no reward? Sometimes that's how it is. I know when Shekinah and I felt God calling us here to San Jose almost two years ago, it was so scary to think about leaving our home, leaving our comfort, leaving the ministry that God had called us to. We had things going. We had, you know, all my favorite food spots. I knew exactly where to eat depending on what day of the week it was. And we were good. And as Shekinah and I were talking about moving down here to San Jose and being part of Bethel's staff, I told Shekinah, I said, I... I don't want to get five years up the road and regret not having the faith to step out of the boat and make this change. I know God is calling us to do this, and man, it's going to risk, it's risky, it's scary, but let's do it. And there's not a day that goes by that we regret taking a leap of faith and following God. When God says change, you got to be willing to welcome the risk and take a big step. Stop waiting for all the answers. God doesn't always give us all the answers. I've learned this in my life that when God wants to change us and direct us into a new thing, here's what happens. God will give you a promise, but not an explanation. He says, I promise you, this is good. I promise you, um, I've got a client. I promise, I promise. But he doesn't explain everything. I, man, I really wish God would explain a little bit more. Sometimes you get out and go, man, I wish you had told me about that. And he goes, yeah, if I did, you probably wouldn't have obeyed me. <laughs> He doesn't give us all the answers. All your ducks will never swim in a straight row. No risk, no reward. Sometimes we got to be careful with this mentality because it requires very little faith when we're not willing to step out. There's a word for those who take all the risk out of living. It's called boring. God hasn't called us to live a boring life. God's plans are exciting. They bring fulfillment. They bring joy. But God's plans also require change. Following Christ is always exciting, but it usually leads to a road that we're not even thinking about. I'll tell you, when uh, I was 16, 17 years old, I answered the call of God on my life. I knew God was calling me into ministry, and I struggled with it because I wanted to do certain things, and I wanted to be certain. You know, I had all my plans, and God said, I want you to go into ministry and at the end of the day, I'll tell you the one reason, one of the main reasons why I said yes to the call of God and the reason I'm even standing here today preaching at you was this, because I did not want to miss out on the adventure that God had for me. And I'll tell you, I had people, I had my mom, my dad, I had coaches, uh, teachers, I had people who thought I was crazy. They said, what do you mean, you're going to go to ministry, you're going to go to Bible college, you're not, what are you doing? And I said... I don't expect you to understand it, but I know what God has called me to, and I would rather chase after the adventure that God has for me than miss everything that God wants to do in my life. Paul is in Antioch. The church is exploding on the scene. Look at what it says in verse 3 of chapter 13. It says, when they fasted and prayed and they laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Isn't it nice? To see the church and the body of Christ get behind the change that was coming. How commendable, how refreshing. They didn't ask any questions. There was no spirit of suspicion, no decision made on feeling or reaction. There was no selfish clinging to Paul and Barnabas. The decision here is made by a deliberate decision of as they were seeking God, they were willing to obey. And they met with the, as they met with the Lord, they made sure that this was his direction and it was clear, and then they just obeyed. That's how it should be in our life. God, we're seeking you, but when he gives clear direction and when he has spoken, then we immediately obey. No questions asked. We go forward into the things that Paul or the things that God has for us. Paul's life is about to change. They were leaving one season. And they were about to head into another. And I want to say this because it's important that we understand this. The way you leave one season of your life always determines how you enter into the next. That the way you leave one chapter will impact the way you enter into the next. And so it's important that when you leave and God's bringing change that we do it and we handle it correctly. And so since change is inevitable and such a big part of our life, let's look today at some principles on change. Let's look today about some things that we need to understand about change. Number one is this. We see that change is always related to obedience. Change made during disobedience is wrong every time. 
Change is related to obedience. I'm obeying Christ, and because I'm obeying him, the change that needs to take place happens. How many times do we try to change things, but it's not what God wants? It's in disobedience, and that's not good. Refusal to change when God directs is wrong every time as well. I, I, I believe that we fight this so many times. We fight change, and we're really fighting against God. And he says, look, you can't fight. You can't fight and win. We need to be obedient. Whatever God's calling you to do today, whatever God is challenging you with, be obedient. Another thing is this. We see that change demands flexibility. It, it's hard to change and stay the same. You, you have to become flexible. And I don't know about you, but I can only speak for myself. I, 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 I like my comfort. I like my things. I, like, I don't naturally just want to, uh, you know, m mix everything up. But change, if you're going to walk through godly change, it demands being flexible. A lack of change leads to stagnation. Stagnation is not a position or preference for God to look for those who fill his purposes. Can you be flexible? Can you maneuver through the change that God's calling you? Another thing that we see is this. That change will always demand dependency upon God. Isn't that true? All of a sudden, God says, hey, I want you to do this. And you're going, how is that going to happen? Trust me. Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge the Lord. Trust the word of God. Trust in his provision. Trust that when you stand with God, all things are possible. Man, when we walk through a season of change, we really have to learn to depend upon God. God, I know you're doing this. How's this going to happen? And so change demands dependency upon God. That's why when we try to get out and change and do it on our own strength, our own wisdom, you know, in our own power, it's so difficult. And we struggle and we fight and we fail half the time because we're not leaning and depending on God. Change is going to demand that you depend upon him, especially when it's change that God is doing. Another thing we see this is that we need to remove the word never in our conversations with God. I have learned to quit saying, God, I will never do that. That's usually somewhere up the road, the next thing God asks me to do. Oh, yeah? You'll never do that, huh? Watch this. You never know what God's going to call you to do. You never know when God's going to whisper something in your ear. You never know what's going to happen. And so when we get into a place where we go, I'll never do that, I'll never do this, you have to be careful with that. I never thought I'd be in San Jose. <laughs> I never thought I would be in ministry. I never thought I would get the honor and the privilege of standing here today and sharing God's word with you. God likes to do the things you never thought possible. <laughs> and so when we're going through change, remove that word. Don't say, God, I'll never do that. It's difficult. Number five is this. We need to let God be God. Don't forget, at the end of the day, we're servants. And servants don't tell the masters what to do. God is the master. God is in charge of all, or he's not in charge at all. Let God be God. God is first. Put God first in everything. Put God first in your life. Lord, what do you want? Lord, your will, not mine. We have to get to a place where we know God is first. Let God be God. Even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, put him first. Because you know what? When God leads your life, it's a lot better than when you lead your life. He knows what's best for you. Number six is this. Don't allow activity to dull your sensitivity. I have occasionally come into seasons of my life where I'm so busy doing that I forget to listen. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced this, but you get to a place where you're doing so much for God, you almost become too busy for God. And you're serving, and you're working, and things are going good, and all of a sudden, God's trying to get your attention, and God's trying to get you to change, and God's trying to go, come on. And we, we have all this activity going on, and we miss the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Romans that those who are sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. We have to make sure that we allow God to lead our lives, that we're sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is doing. Number seven, and this is the biggest one, make sure that when change comes, you're ready to say yes. Ready to say yes. I, I have practiced in my life of just trying to say yes when God's moving. 
Let's look at some personal applications today on this. Some things that we need to understand. Number one is this. God never calls from without also calling you to. God never calls us from without also calling you to. If God's calling you from something, he's also calling you to something. When God called Abraham, it was from his land to go to another land. When the, when the Hebrews left Egypt, they were calling him from Egypt to the promised land. This is always a great discipline to start and to put in your life that when God is changing things, ask yourself, God, okay, you're calling me from this. What are you calling me to? What direction are you sending me to? See, we can never enter into a place of blessing without first leaving a position of comfort. If God has taken us from something, then the place that he's leading us, we need to go, okay, God, where are you leading us? Number two is this. I think we need to practice saying yes on the smaller issues. Train your obedience on the issues of little things like tithing, devotions, witnessing. If we're not saying yes to the little changes God's trying to make in our lives, how are we ever going to say yes to the big things? How are we going to follow God into the ends of the earth if we can't do the little things right now? Practice always makes you more accomplished in anything. I remember when I played baseball. I played baseball for years. I wanted to play in college, wanted to play professionally. You know, and every time we practiced, no matter how good we were, no matter how older we got, we always practiced the basics, the little things, until they became second nature. We wanted to make sure that everything, even the simple things, we knew how to do. That's what it's like when we say yes to the little things. Yes, Lord, I'll witness. Yes, Lord, I'll tithe. Yes, Lord, I'll pray. Yes, Lord, I will read my Bible. We learn to say yes in the little things, and then when God brings the big things, it's easy to say yes. Number three, change in your life is not if, it's when, and it's what. Whether we like it or not, everything changes. Seasons change, people change, times change. God desires change for you, and we fight it. Who are you going to allow to win the battle of wills? Because that's ultimately what change is. It's us battling for our will versus God's will. Prayers about change, questions about personal change are the ones that God seems to answer the fastest. When we begin to pray about change and we begin to ask God about personal changes, he says, okay, let's start working on this. Let's start changing. We need to get to a place we say, not my will, Lord, yours. See, until we come to the grips, until we come to grips with the fact that things in our life need to change, they won't. Your willingness to obey and change results in blessings your willingness to obey and change results in blessings and growth. God's blessings are always attached to obedience. And when God says, I want you to change and we're obedient, there's growth and there's blessings in that. There are some classic battles of change in the Bible. We see in Exodus when God wanted to release the people from, from uh, Egypt, Pharaoh several times told Moses no. Pharaoh looked, or Moses looked at Pharaoh and said, I want you to let the people go. And Pharaoh said, no. God wanted this situation to change, and yet it didn't change immediately. There was a delay. But then it says this, that God spoke, and suddenly everything changed. And when they left, it says they left with the riches and the wealth of Egypt. Sometimes when there's a delay in the change, it's because God is wanting to bless you and promote you and put you in a better position for when change comes. Most change takes place not when God requests it, but when it comes to the point that something must change in your life. Think about Samson. Samson had many warnings, and yet he ignored. Samson had many chances to change, but it wasn't until he was broken, until he was blind, until he was bald, until he was in the presence of his enemy that finally he said, okay, I'll change, Lord. Isn't that true? God asks us to change. God gives us warning after warning, and it isn't until we're finally broken, finally down and out, finally into the lowest place that we say, okay, well, God, now I'll change. You know, we wait till we're in bankruptcy court, and our money is completely squandered, and our financial uh, situation's a mess, and we can't pay our bills, and then we go, okay, well, I guess I'll start tithing. You know, too many times we wait till we have no other option. We wait till we're like the prodigal son down in the pig pen of life. And we go, well, okay, maybe it is better at the father's house. Maybe I should change. Maybe I should start praying. Maybe I should start 
serving God. Don't do that. Don't wait till everything is broken in your life to say, okay, God, change me. Just start changing and saying yes to what he's doing now. Number four is this. It's my last point. We're going to close our time out today. God changes who you are, not only what you do. Isn't that so good? That it's not just about changing what you do. It's about changing who you are. Acts 13, 9, it says, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, in one sentence, in one moment, God changed who he was. Without change, we cannot accomplish all that God has planned for us. Acts chapter 1 Verse 8, there's an interesting verse that I love. It talks about when the Holy Spirit comes. It says this, when the Holy Spirit comes, you shall receive power and you will be, you will be my witnesses. It doesn't say you shall receive power and then you will do witnessing. It says you will be my witnesses and then the gospel will be spread to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, the power of the Holy Spirit in our life is to change what we be come so that we can do and go for God. Change is about who am I? What is God making me? Lord, change me, help me to be, so that I can go and do. Our prayer today should be this, Lord, change me. Lord, make me, and then send me. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you today for this word. I ask that God, there would be something today of truth that stuck with us. That, God, you're calling all of us to seasons and times of change. And, God, how we handle that change is so important. God, I ask and pray that today you would help us through the process of change. To know that you are making us more and more into your image. That, God, you want us to be more and more like you. Father, I thank you for this word, and I pray that, again... Your words would continue to stay with us. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.